Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. All right, it's uh, my pleasure to welcome uh, David Bly here, uh, where he's a professor of statistics and computer science at Columbia University. He recently moved there from Princeton. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with his work on probabilistic topic models, uh, Bayesian nonparametric methods, and a variety of approximate inference methods. Um, David has done a great variety of work in uh, applications to text, uh, multimedia images, a variety of different things, as well as his uh, contributions theoretically. Um, and has uh, won a, a number of uh, different awards that are too numerous to, to actually list here, I think, at the intro. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and just hand things over to David here, and we're going to hear from him about some of his methods in integrating user behavior. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for inviting me here. Uh, my name is Dave Bly. I'm going to talk about probabilistic topic models and user behavior. Um, so, as you know, here at Microsoft, as we collect uh, uh, large archives of electronic texts. That comes with uh, a huge challenge, which is that we need to somehow organize, visualize, summarize, search through them, form predictions about them, and understand them quickly. Right? We, we collect massive collections of text data now every day. Um, and doing this requires that we have new algorithmic tools, new uh, machine learning tools to be able to process and understand large bodies of texts. Um, what probabilistic topic models do is take big unorganized collections of text and, and organize them programmatically. Um, loosely speaking, the, the process is to take your big collection, use an algorithm to discover the underlying thematic structure in that collection. Um, once you've done that, discovered what the topics are, annotate the documents according to those topics, as though you had people going through and, and, and labeling the documents by hand, and then finally use those annotations to do whatever it is you want to do, visualize, organize, summarize, whatever it might be. Um, so here's an example of a, of a topic model, uh, of, a, of a picture of a summary of a big collection of text that a topic model provides. So here, um, each, uh, each node in this graph is a collection of words that are associated under a single theme. These are themes that were discovered by the algorithm. So you can see here mantle, crust, meteorites, ratios, something about uh, geog uh, geology. geology. Um, Topic models know the difference between geography and geology, but I don't. That's why we do this. Um, and, uh, and, and so this is called a topic. This is discovered by the algorithm. And in this picture, this is, this is a topic model fit to a big collection of scientific articles. A connection between two topics means that they are likely to occur together in a document. So something about um, solar, the, the sun is more likely to also be about like atmospheric science, say, than it is to be about something about genetics. Okay, so in came a big collection of documents, out pops this picture that summarizes what's in it. Um, we can also look at how topics change over time. So here is another type of model um, where uh, now instead of a single collection of words associated under a theme, each topic is a changing a set of words that are associated under the theme. And so here you can see a topic that the model discovers. This is called a dynamic topic model, um, which describes neuroscience. So here, um, I should say, this is fit to Science Magazine from 1880 till 2000. I used to say the present, but it's just 2000. Um, and uh, here we have the neuroscience topic, where you see the word neuron increasing in its activity over time, the word nerve decreasing, the word oxygen peaking and decreasing. Um, here's another topic from that same fit where the word laser, you know, lasers weren't invented till about here, and so it makes sense that laser increases in its activity after they're invented. The word force kind of decreases, the word relativity peaks and then decreases. So this gives us another type of picture of what's going on in the collection, again, automatically derived from the algorithm. Um, This is another picture from that same dynamic topic model, but looking at the topic in a different way. Uh, instead of 
uh, looking at a single word and how it changes over time, we can look at the, the most salient words from a topic and, and, and how they changed over the decades. And in this topic, it started out in 1880 with words like electric, machine, power, steam, iron, battery, wire. Slowly changes through the decades in the 1940s, air, tube, apparatus, laboratory, pressure, and then up to 2000, devices, silicon technology. So this topic, given again science articles from 1880 to the present, captured that there is something about the about the technology needed to do science, and it's a, it's a theme in this collection, and it's a theme that has changed over the decades, and there's no supervision needed, no metadata about the articles being about technology, nothing about which words are about technology. <coughs> this kind of complicated pattern comes out of just analyzing the texts. Question, yeah. Now your topics represent all the words in your corpus, or no? It's just like, are these the top words you're talking about, or, you know? Yeah, good question. So, um, so right, I'll define a topic in a little bit, very soon. Um, these are just kind of the words that represent the topic, yeah, the, the top words of the topic. But indeed, the, the topic more formally, you'll see this later, is a representation over the whole vocabulary, and this is the top words. And please interrupt me. I noticed when I got the schedule from Paul, there's like an hour and a half for this talk, and it's only an hour-long talk, so please interrupt me with questions. But I have another talk that I can show you afterwards, I guess, if we run out of time. <laughs> but then we have to go for two and a half hours. Topic models can be integrated into other models of data. So here is, um, this is a model I worked on a long time ago, a model of images and text, where we use a topic model to analyze the text, a different model to analyze the images, and connect them um, in a, in a uh, and, and connect the two representations that the models capture. And so what you can do with this model now is take unannotated images, like a picture of a bird, and predict what words go with that image. So here's a picture of a bird, and the model predicts that words like birds, nest, tree, branch, and leaves goes with this picture. Um, actually, I just met Ryan from Scotland, and this really is a picture of Scotland. So you can see that it's a very good model, although every picture in the training set of farms was a Scottish farm, so it's not, you know, if it sees any kind of green pastures, it's going to say it's Scotland. <laughs> Related algorithms can be used to analyze big network data as well. So um, this isn't exactly a topic model, but it's a related type of hidden variable model called a mixed membership model. And here uh, we have a large social network, and we want to uncover the um, <coughs> communities that exist in that social network. But of course, um, when we have a large network, we don't expect that each person belongs to just one community, which classical community finding algorithms uh, assume, but rather, you know, you might be on a social network and you have some friends from your neighborhood, some friends from work, some friends from your high school. Um, you want to capture that there are these overlapping communities that live in the social networks. And here's a picture of a big network, and it's and where and I've showed the overlapping communities that the that the model has uncovered. Okay, so these are all the kinds of things we can do with topic modeling and with the sort of algorithms that are associated with topic modeling. Okay, so what I, I want to focus on today is our um, recent work on integrating user behavior into topic modeling. So the uh, insight we had is that people read documents, right? We don't just have these big electronic uh, collections of documents that we want to organize, but we often have information about who's reading those documents. This could be clickstream, who's clicking on documents, or it could be um, more formal than that, actual people reporting that they have read an article. And there are two kinds of things we can do with data about who is reading a big collection of documents. One, these might be people for whom we want to form predictions. Okay, So for example, here's the New York City subway. You can see a lot of people reading documents on the subway, as they always do. And we might want to take the history of this fellow's reading and predict for him something that he'd want to read in the future, um, the classical recommendation problem. Um, also, and I think this is uh, also interesting and maybe less looked at is that people's reading behavior is an additional signal about what the documents mean, how, where, where the documents sit in this bigger collection. In other words, you know, I was using in those previous pictures, I was using the words of the articles to show you summaries of what's going on in the collection, but who's, who's reading those articles can also help us help inform those pictures, help us understand what's going on in the collection. So here's an example of Charles Darwin's library. You know, 
forming recommendations for Charles Darwin is not a useful thing to do right now. Um, but knowing what books are in his library tells us something about those books. And if we had every scientist's library, you know, cataloged, and we knew which books were in Charles Darwin's library, Einstein's library, other people's libraries, that tells us something about um, who might want to read those books or what those books, wh where they live in the, in the big uh, landscape of scientific literature. Okay, so in this talk, I want to start by giving an introduction to topic modeling, more formally define some of the things I showed you pictures of in the beginning. Then talk about recommendation and exploration with collaborative topic models. This is the work about integrating user behavior into topic models. And then finally talk a little bit about the bigger picture and how all of this is really just a case study in using probability models to solve problems with data, just for like five minutes. I know that looks vacuous, so I'll focus on the first two. Um, Okay, so let me give a brief introduction to topic modeling, what these ideas are, because the, the user behavior builds on this. Um, so the, the, uh, I want to start by talking about the simplest topic model called latent Dirichlet allocation. So the, the intuition behind latent Dirichlet allocation is that documents exhibit multiple topics. Okay, here's a document. This is from Science Magazine called Seeking Life's Bare Genetic Necessities. And it's an article about determining the number of genes that an organism needs to survive in the evolutionary sense. Okay, so there's an organism. It's like lots of years ago, millions of years ago. You know, is that organism going to make it? You know, the turtle. Is the turtle going to get there? Um, this article is about using data analysis, genetics, and evolutionary biology methods to determine this number. And what I've done by hand here is highlighted different words with different colors. So words like computational, numbers, predictions, words about data analysis, I highlighted in blue. Um, words like genome, sequenced, genes, words about genetics, I highlighted in yellow. And words like organisms, life, survive, um, words about evolutionary biology, I highlighted in pink. So what you can imagine is if I took the time and highlighted every word in this article, throwing away stop words like and and but and of, um, and then you squinted at the article, you'd see it's kind of pink, blue, and yellow. It, it, it blends words from data analysis, words from evolutionary biology, and words from um, genetics. And if you looked at every article in science and took the time to highlight each article with each word in each article with its corresponding theme, you would see that the articles of science represent this heterogeneous mix of different topics, that there's neuroscience, there's data analysis, there's genetics, there's astronomy, and so on. So the intuition behind LDA is that documents exhibit multiple topics. So what LDA does, and now we can define a topic, is it embeds that intuition into a formal probabilistic generative model of the document collection. Okay, so here's how that works. On the outside, oh, he told me to stay on this side of the room. On the outside of the document collection live a collection of topics. Each topic is now a, is defined as a distribution over a fixed vocabulary. So there's some vocabulary, say 10,000 words, and each topic is a distribution over those words. And what I've done here, these are fake, but I've listed them in order of probability. So here's data, number, computer with some probability, brain, neuron, nerve, and so on, okay? That lives outside the collection. Then, for each document, we assume that the document is generated as follows. First, choose a distribution over topics. Okay, so for this document, I chose the pink, yellow, and blue topic with different proportion. Then, for each word in the document, choose a colored coin from this distribution. So here I chose the blue coin. Look up the, the topic that blue coin is associated with and choose a word, analysis, in this case, from that topic. Repeat this for every word in the document. Here I chose the yellow coin, the word genetic, the pink coin, the word life, and so on. And so you repeat this for every word in the document. You get a big bag of words. That's your document. Turn the page of science. Choose a new distribution over topics. This one might be about neuroscience and data analysis. And choose its words. Okay, so this is a, you, you'll notice this is a bag of words model. The order of the words isn't modeled here. It we, we, uh, doesn't matter. Um, uh, but this is a perfectly good generative process for drawing a collection of documents from a set of topics. The problem, of course, is that we don't get to observe any of that stuff. Okay, so um, the 
Topic proportions, the topic assignments, and importantly, the topics themselves are all unknown. We just have this big bag of documents, this big collection of documents. And so the main computational problem, the main algorithmic problem, the machine learning and statistical problem, is to infer all of this uh, hidden structure from the, ob from the uh, observed data. And the bag of words assumption, you know, you might think, oh, that's not realistic, and it's true, it's not. Um, but if your goal is to understand what the topics are that describe the collection, you can imagine that if, if I jumbled all these words and I, and I didn't show you what, what order they really came in, and you looked at it, you would be able to say, well, I don't know what this is about because obviously the words are jumbled, but it somehow blends data analysis, genetics, and evolutionary biology. Okay. So that's LDA, the simplest topic model. As a graphical model, so just I will, I'm sure most of you know what a graphical model is, but I'll remind you. Um, and a graphical model is a representation of a joint distribution of hidden and observed variables. Uh, each node is a random variable. Uh, shaded node is observed. Unshaded node is hidden. And an edge between two nodes um, uh, indicates that uh, there's a dependence between this random variable and this random variable. And these plates here um, denote replication. Okay, so here are the K topics that describe the collection. For each document, that's the D plate, I first choose a distribution over those topics, that's theta. And then for each word in the document, I choose the colored coin Z, and I choose the word from the corresponding topic. Okay, so this, this picture describes the joint distribution of those variables that, that were at play in that generative process. Okay? Graphical models, which, you know, a lot of the foundational work on graphical models was done right here. Um, graphical models uh, connect, uh, they encode the independence assumptions between the random variables. They connect to algorithms for computing with, um, for computing about these kinds of joint distributions. All right? So, and you'll notice the only thing observed here is WDN, the nth word in the dth document. Uh, using graphical models algorithms, we can figure out how to compute the conditional distribution of all of this hidden structure, which is, of course, what I told you is the main <coughs> problem with topic modeling. Yeah. Yeah. In your previous picture, you had the topics. So the number of topics, you give it the number of topics as an input <coughs> the LDA. Uh, yeah, so the number of topics here is K, and that's fixed. Right, so you decide that in advance, or you can set that using cross-validation, or you can do fancy things like Bayesian non-parametrics. So as the number of topics is going to go up, like there would be a point, an extreme point, that each topic could contain only one word, like one word with probability one, and the rest of the words would be like probability zero. Like the top word would be, you know, with that. Well, I'll get to that. It's a great question and a good point. That depends on the objective function. Right? There's a conditional distribution here, and there are priors at play. There's a, there's a prior over what the topics look like. There's a prior over what these topic proportions look like. Um, and there is a, also a likelihood. And uh, we'll th let's think in a couple slides about what that likelihood means in terms of what kinds of topics it prefers. But yes, that's right. So kind of if there were number of topics equal to the number of words, you know, one way to describe the documents is to have one word in each topic, but that's not necessarily going to be the best way. Okay, so just to go in a little more detail about the graphical model, and hopefully you can see its connection to that cartoon picture I showed. So this is a joint distribution over our big ensemble of random variables. That joint defines a posterior, right, the probability of the topic proportions for all the documents, the topic assignments for all the words of all the documents, and the topics themselves given all of the documents, right? We, we're given this big collection of documents. We want to infer this hidden structure. And um, what we do, in all, to, for example, to make those pictures that I showed you in the beginning of the talk, is we infer these hidden variables from the data, and then we use posterior expectations of those hidden variables to do whatever it is we want to do, to do information retrieval, to compute similarity between documents under the context of their topics, to explore, make pictures about the uh, document collections and other tasks. Okay, so those pictures I showed you in the beginning, these are all posterior expectations of hidden structure visualized so that we can learn something about the corpus that we couldn't otherwise see if we just had this big bag of documents. All right, there are many methods for doing posterior inference, for solving that inference problem. Hey, I won't uh, 
talk about any of them here, although I have one slide at the end about stochastic inference, which is a way to scale up this kind of computation to massive data sets and has a one slide explanation, so worth putting it in. But it's after the talk, so you ask me if you want to see it. Um, but basically, there are lots and lots of ways to do this. All of these methods are methods for approximating that conditional distribution that I said, the conditional distribution of the topic structure given the observations. Some of the um, most exciting recent methods involve factorization and these, sort of this new spectral approach to inference, which has now been applied to topic modeling. OK. I should mention one more thing. Uh, in all the results I'm going to show you here, we're using mean field variational methods and stochastic variational inference. OK, so let's see this at work. We took the OCR collection from Science Magazine, 10 Years of Science. I'm sure here at Microsoft, even, even now for me, this is a very small corpus, 17,000 documents, 11 million observations, a vocabulary of 20,000. And we fit a 100 topic LDA model using variational inference. Okay, So I took this big collection and I asked for 100 topics and a decomposition of the corpus. Here's that original article. Here is the real theta. This is the inferred topic proportions for this article. Remember, I, I got 100 topics, and then I, now I'm asking which of those 100 topics is this article exhibiting. And if you look at the most frequent words, remember each topic, the, the, there's only a handful of these have been activated. Each one is associated with a distribution over terms, and the most frequent words from the most frequent topics rep correspond to things that we recognize as genetics, evolutionary biology, diseases and survival, and data analysis. Okay, so you can see that, again, without any metadata or extra information, we were able to uh, get a kind of intuitive representation of what the document is about through this latent structure. OK, this gets to your question. Why does this work? One answer to why it works is, well, I made a probability model. It captured my intuitions. I just looked at the posterior, and it did the thing that I was hoping it would do. It's not a very satisfying answer, although it's one that I gave for probably like five to eight years. Um, one way to think about how it works is to ask yourself, why does the posterior look the way it does? And um, here's one way to think about that. If you look at the posterior, which is proportional to the joint distribution, you can see mathematically that LDA tries to trade off two goals. One goal is that in each document, it wants to allocate its words to few topics. Okay, so it pays a price if there are many topics that it allocates its a document's words to more than if it just allocates a document to a few topics. The reason is that those topic proportions normalize. Okay. The second goal is that in each topic, it wants to assign high probability to just a few terms. Okay, so it also pays a price if a topic is spread out over many, many terms, again, because those topics <coughs> normalize. And these goals are at odds. If you take a document, like this one, and you say, OK, this document's just about one topic. You put all of its words in the same topic. Well, that means that that topic has to have high probability for all those words for the, for the model to, to see any benefit. And that, of course, uh, is at odds with goal number two, to have few words in each topic. Conversely, if you say each word in this document is assigned to a, its own topic, then that's good for those topics because they each only have one word in them. But uh, for that document, it's going to have to use many, many topics to cover uh, all of the words in the document. So this is, if you kind of unpack the posterior, this is, this is why LDA works. And so it, what, what it tries to do is trade off these two goals. And that helps it find these groups of tightly co-occurring words. Yeah? I think to rehash uh, this intuition, you could say that per word in a document, you can pay a price in the example that she gave, if you have as many topics as words, then you would pay a fixed price for every word, depending on which word it is in the vocabulary, right? Um, but if you have topic models, you, know, you pay enough front cost for the, using that topic, and then you pay only the costs for individual words given, given the topic. If topics are very uh, deterministic, then you only pay uh, as many times as you have topics in the document versus as many times as you have words in the document. Is that, does that cover what you're saying about the odds? 
I, I'm not sure. I must. I admit that I'm not sure. It sounds. It's, it sounds like it does that. So yeah, I mean, you were talking about paying a price. I was saying that too, but really I, maybe it's better to think of it like rewards where if you only have one topic in a document, then each time, so, so let me be a little less mysterious. There's an objective function at play here, which is something like the log posterior. And that log posterior is like the log joint. And the log joint, there is a term for every topic assignment log probability of that topic assignment, a term for every word, log probability of the word given the topic that it was assigned to. And those are the two important pieces. Um, if it's only in one document, sorry, if a document's only in one topic, then that first uh, reward you get, log probability of the topic assignment, it's, it's as high as it can go, because it's gonna have probability one. And so when you add topics, you end up taking away from, and that log there is important. When you add topics, you end up taking away from how much benefit you get for that document. But of course, but then it's the opposite on the words. And then you're paying price per word. Exactly, and then that's you pay this price per word, and that's what. see if you're paying, uh, if the words can be grouped, then you pay a topic per a price per group, and not so much per word. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, yeah, I mean, if you want to think more about this, I encourage you to write down the log probability of all of the hidden and observed variables, stare at it, and then just talk to yourself. Priors you put, this would be yes, so that's another, so I think that's a misconception. The misconception is that, oh sure, yeah, um, it's because of this, this very small Dirichlet parameter that we're getting these sparse topics. I think that those small Dirichlet parameters encourage the inference algorithms to go in the right direction towards this kind of solution, but it's in fact the normalization, the fact that it has to sum to one, that encourages sparsity. Sparsity at all. You can't really force <coughs> very strong sparsity because right? you, you see can't so much make data. It have only three topics per document. That's right, that's right. I mean, it helps in the sense that a Dirichlet parameter that's very small put, puts high probability mass on sparse solutions, but when you're overwhelmed with data, especially on the topic side where there's you know millions or billions of observations underneath that Dirichlet, it's not like the prior matters much. And Dirichlet is more likely to make it fuller than sparse. You can increase using more. You can, if you increase the Dirichlet parameters, you can make sure that more topics are being used. Well, not less it, topics are being used. Again, though, the, the normalization encourages sparsity. It's yeah. it, the prior doesn't matter at that point. Okay. Interesting. Um, okay, so that's all I wanted to say about LDA. It in, discovers themes through posterior inference. Um, this really built on the seminal work by Deerwester et al., including people like Sue Dumay. Um, on latent semantic analysis. Okay, that started the whole enterprise of factorizing document by term matrices, which LDA is essentially a probabilistic factorization of a document term matrix. Um, probabilistic LSI, Hoffman's work from the late 90s, uh, was really the predecessor to LDA, which took this work and made it a bit more Bayesian, but also, more importantly, let it um, be used as a module in more complicated models. I'll show you that in the next slide. Um, in statistics, this idea is called a mixed membership model. Okay, specifically, um, forgetting about documents, you can think of a document here, forgetting about documents, think about a document. Forgetting about documents, you can think about this plate as representing data sets. And here we have a data set that's drawn from a mixture model, right? Here are the mixture proportions, for those of you familiar with this language, here are the mixture proportions, here's the mixture assignment, here is the data point, and these are the mixture components. So what LDA is, is it's called a mixed membership model. It's like we're modeling a bunch of data sets, each with a mixture model, where the mixture components are shared across data sets, but the mixture proportions change from data set to data set. And this idea is used in a lot of different settings. I showed you this picture from network analysis. It's used in doing survey analysis. Um, it's used to analyze music. It, it's, it's kind of its own little industry in statistics. Um, and as an example of that, this exact model was independently invented around the same time we were working on it for population genetics. Now my group is working on these kinds of problems as well, where basically, um, you know, if you have a thousand or a million people, you can sequence their genomes, and each of our genomes, I don't know much about this, but I can try to explain it. Each of our genomes um, reflects the ancestral populations that were roaming the earth lots of years ago 
reproducing to form us eventually over time. Um, and you know, I might be kind of part Australian, part African, part European. You might be part European, part African, and so on. And um, you can detect that we are all what are called admixtures, which is like this theta heterogeneous topic proportions. We are all admixtures of these different ancestral populations, and then uncover what those ancestral populations' genetic signature was. Okay, so. I, so take a bunch of people now, sequence their genomes, figure out what populations roamed the earth millions of years ago to form those people, loosely speaking. That's what they do in population genetics. It sounds goofy, but it's really important for um, doing things like correcting for ancestry when you're doing studies of, say, the link between a disease and a gene. It's also important for exploratory analysis of big genetic data, so all the same kinds of things that, that uh, topic models are used for. Okay. LDA is a simple building block, like I just mentioned, that enables many applications. So here are some examples of, of, of more complicated models from the literature, from the research literature, that use LDA as a module. And one of the advantages of graphical models is that an algorithm you derive for LDA, for that little three-node graphical model, can be used as kind of a subroutine in whatever algorithm you need for this complicated beast. Um, and I think this is one of the reasons that uh, LDA has become uh, a popular tool to use in machine learning research. Um, another reason is, of course, that we need these kinds of unsupervised learning methods. Organizing and finding patterns in data has become important everywhere. And algorithmic improvements with LDA as kind of a test case let us fit these types of models now to massive data sets. I'm going to show you a model with LDA as a module in the second part of the talk. Um, you know, more broadly, just to finish up about LDA, I think of topic modeling as a case study, really, in doing text analysis with probability models, where we build a model, we have a bunch of data, our model reflects whatever assumptions we want to make about the data, we then do inference on the hidden variables given the observations, and then from those inferences, we do whatever it is we want to do. Okay, this is a nice way to separate out the different activities in probabilistic modeling. And so what topic modeling research looks like is somebody developing a new model, somebody developing new inference algorithms, like that long list that I showed you, or developing new applications, visualizations, tools. Frankly, I don't think there's enough of this kind of research where um, you know, we treat as given that the model is going to be useful, but understanding what to do with these inferences, how to effectively build interfaces to them, how to use them to do search, to do prediction. Um, this, these are important parts of topic modeling research. So I suppose that prediction here includes classification. Mm -hmm. Yeah, any kind of prediction. OK, it's easy to use LDA in R. There's lots of open source implementations of LDA. Um, so just as an example, if you have a bunch of documents, one per line, you represent them sparsely, you run five lines of R, you can quickly get out the topics that, that um, created those articles, and then use those inferences to do whatever it is you're trying to do. Any other questions about topic modeling? That was the first part of the talk. I want to build on that in the second part of the talk. So, so is there any better way than you just used earlier to describe different topics? Right. So, so that normally you don't, I mean, the, the way you use the word to describe the topic don't seem to be the same as the top one, right? It's yeah, that's, that's a good question. Different. Right, so that goes along with, with this, right? So how do we name the topics? How do we best visualize the topics? This is clearly not the answer to that question, right? Yeah, so the, no, the, the, you know, that is a, that's kind of a user interface question. Um, and here, you know, I thought it was a big achievement when I made the words bigger, according to their probability. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, uh, there are research fields that would be better equipped to do something more interesting. Frankly, you know, this uh, topic modeling has begun to be used a lot in the, what's called the digital humanities, people like historians and English scholars using these techniques to get a handle on big electronic collections of newspapers or whatever it is they're analyzing. And they've done beautiful things to visualize them, right? Because they are like humanity scholars, so they're good at that stuff. And, and um, yeah, I, so there's a fellow, Matt Jockers, at the University of Nebraska, and his topics look much better than anybody else's. They, uh, he, he does really nice, he has really nice ways of, of summarizing these distributions visually. It's an important problem. 
Yeah. Um, in your opinion, what's the best way to evaluate these topic models, right? Like, especially when you're talking about the number of topics and how you could pick different ones, what's the best way to see that this representation is the best one for this course? Yeah, that's right. a great question. So that's another issue. These are two core issues, visualizing and evaluating. Um, and they're core because they're kind of fuzzy, right? There's no quick answer to that. Um, what we use, so in a, in a typical machine learning paper about topic modeling, we use something like held out log likelihood, where you take a portion of your data, you don't see it, and then you predict it. There, there even are a couple of ways of doing that. I have one way that I prefer, um, but you know, there's like kind of a little unimportant debate around it. Um, so that's a way to, to, to ask the question, which model is better? The idea being that a model that, gives, that assigns higher probability to future data from the same unknown process that the model, that, that from, the, from the same unknown process of the data that you care about, um, is a better model. One that assigns higher probability to future data is a better model. And that idea really stems from even, even for exploratory tasks in the 70s, people like Seymour Geiser, statisticians like Seymour Geiser, um, promoted predictive likelihood as a way of measuring model fitness. Um, if you're doing something with the topic model, like you're doing information retrieval or <coughs> collaborative filtering or classification, then probably however you want to evaluate that downstream process is how you're going to want to evaluate the model on the way to that, to that solution. Um, although that might be too expensive, and so something like predictive likelihood could be a good proxy. Um, yeah. And then there are also, there might be kind of visual ways to assess the model. There's, and, and that's a tension that's coming up in this digital humanities work where, you know, the um, scholar will say, well, I have, I ran the algorithm 50 times. There are 50 local optima that it found. Which one should I pick? And you say, well, pick the one with the highest predictive likelihood. And then she says, yeah, but that one doesn't look the best. The one that looks the best is this one. And then I say, well, you can't pick that one. It's got a lower predictive likelihood. And then, you know, then they'll pick it. Um, <laughs> so this is an issue. And it's a tension. And it's one, you know, there's a lot of interesting open problems there. Another interesting open problem is that the human, humanist, the, and I'm saying humanist, but don't feel like that doesn't include you. Anybody who wants to use these to do any kind of exploratory data analysis, um, you know, you might have three fits of topic models, and some topics are good in some, and others are good in others, and you want to somehow combine them. There's no easy way to do that. That's an interesting open issue in this in this world. So not all the topic evaluation. Do you know of any task in classification that this model, which you said, can do can do better? Well, I don't work much on classification, so I'm not sure, yeah. Actually, I want to mention one other thing, which is um, a way of evaluating topics visually is using something called posterior predictive checks. That's something I worked on with David Mimno, um, where you can, so here's another issue. It's making it sound like there are more issues than good things about this work. Um, another issue is that you might fit a topic model. There are 100 topics. Some of those are there because they are real patterns in the data, neurons, brain. Okay? There's a real pattern in the data that it's capturing. Others might be there because, you know, you have a very complicated corpus written by many people and they're smart and they did science research and it's not that they generated their data from a multinomial distribution. And so um, <laughs> some of those topics are there because they're accounting for that model misfit. You know, if you know about Gaussian mixtures, the way that a Gaussian, a, a Gaussian mixture with enough mixture components can capture any distribution, a topic model with enough topics can capture the kind of idiosyncrasies that, uh, of the distribution of language that, that um, you know, a multinomial can't capture. And you might not care about those. Posterior predictive checks can help you identify which topics are interpretable and which ones aren't, which could be important, say, to a humanist or anyone doing exploration. Are there any, any specific kinds of corpuses or documents where topic modeling would not work well? Well, you'll see that I look almost exclusively at things like news and scientific articles. Um, I think it's probably hard with things like Twitter. Um, so I know that I've seen some Twitter topic, I haven't read a lot of Twitter topic modeling papers, but there are a lot of them. And some of them I know, and I think this works, where you take the Twitter user, like, like Paul is on Twitter, and you, know, you take all of his tweets and that's a document. It's the Paul document. But that's not satisfying, right? Because there should be a way to think about the tweets individually. I'm sure there's a lot of work to do there. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's, it's 
discriminating informative topics, yeah. real topics, real patterns from the ones that are just trying to uh, increase the likelihood of the data. Um, ha has anybody tried to simply not model all the words in the document, but allow for 10% kind of to be unexplained? I have seen that. I can't recall the author or title. But yeah, the, some kind of robust opt-out background topic. I've, I've heard that that's useful. Yeah, I've heard that that's a useful thing to do. Yeah. yeah, Michael Jordan had a paper a couple years ago on a hierarchical uh, topic model where there was a base distribution that common words could just come from, and it did seem to help him a lot. Okay, good, right. Michael Jordan did it. <laughs> it's a good answer to all questions. Has anyone tried? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So uh, there was something else I was going to mention around that question. No, oh, I can't remember now. But yes, um, Twitter I think is difficult, uh, but interesting. Okay, so like I said, I want to talk about how people read documents. And we've been working lately, we've been very interested in this lately, and been working on what are called collaborative topic models that connect the content of the articles to people's patterns in consuming those articles. And as I mentioned, this helps people find documents that they're interested in. It learns about how people are organizing the documents, and it learns about the people who are reading the documents. So I thought you would be interested in this here at Microsoft. OK, so here's an example. Scientists share their research libraries. OK, we all here probably have some kind of research library on our hard drive, right? Chris Meek has his BibTeX file that's probably a lot of years old and has thousands of articles in it. Um, so if we all put our, our, our BibTeX libraries online, we would get a matrix like this, where in the rows we have articles, in the columns we have people, and we have a black dot if this person in this column has the mathematics of statistical machine translation in um, his or her library. Okay, so what can we do with this? Well, like I mentioned, we can form recommendations. We can form recommendations of old articles and new articles. Okay, so this is in recommendation literature is called the cold start problem. And the problem is this, that let's say we're going to, let's say we're going to do this, but we're not going to use the text of the articles. Well, um, when, uh, if we want to recommend the EM article to someone, it's not that hard. We look at the other articles you've read. We figure out what you're interested in. We look at what other people who are interested in the same things liked. If they liked the EM article and you hadn't read it yet, then we recommend you the EM article. Of course, the issue with that is that it requires that the EM article is not a brand new article. It's not, luckily. But for new articles, we'd have an issue, right? Where topic models for recommendation comes out, nobody has read it yet, who do we recommend it to? Okay, you can imagine that the text is going to play a role. With collaborative topic models, we can describe users in terms of their preferences. So what does that mean? Well. Classical matrix factorization methods for doing recommendation basically will describe someone in terms of dimensions 61, 32, and 95. Whereas with collaborative topic models, these dimensions, preference dimensions, are going to be attached to topics, just like we just saw, and so they're going to have some kind of meaning. You're going to be able to say, well, this person is interested in machine learning and computer vision and um, web media. Finally, I think this is very interesting, we can identify impactful interdisciplinary articles. So this is what I meant more crisply when I said that we can understand how the document collection is implicitly organized. Um, we, can take the do we can take the EM article, for example, and show you why the EM article has had an impact outside of what the EM article is talking about. OK, so let me give you the intuition. Does this talk really go till noon? We have the room till then. Ah, Usually, when okay. that happens, people start getting sparse, so you can kind of go into that time. Gotcha. Good answer. Okay, <laughs> I'm not going to treat it like an hour and a half talk then. Okay, so let's talk about the EM article. Have any of you read it? Yep, it's a good article. It's from 1977. You know what? It, so let's imagine we're in. You know, the, 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 the we have the EM article, and that there's two types of people: computer vision researchers and statisticians. Okay. You look at the EM article, and it's 1977. It just came out. If you've read it, you know that it's about one thing, statistics. Right? This is an old statistics article. Here is our representation of the EM article when it just comes out. It's about statistics. Now let's suppose, again, like I mentioned, that there's two, there's two kinds of topics, and there's also two kinds of scientists. 
statisticians and vision researchers. Here are statisticians, they're only interested in statistics. Here are vision researchers, they're only interested in vision. When the EM paper comes out, we're going to recommend it to the statisticians. Right? We're going to take the dot product of these two vectors and we're going to say, you guys should read the EM paper. Now let's say I got everyone's BibTeX file. All right, so here are the users by papers. It's now however many years later, 30 years later. And um, when I look at users by papers, I can detect through the kind of model I'm going to describe that computer vision researchers are interested in the EM paper. Okay, that's this red spike on vision. And now consider again these two scientists. I will recommend the paper to both the statisticians and the vision researchers. So what I want to point out is that without the text of the EM paper, right, if we were just in a classical recommendation system, we wouldn't be able to initially recommend it to anyone until somebody bothered to read it. Without user data, we can't recommend it to vision researchers at all. Okay, so if we only had the text and we didn't have any kind of interaction data between people and papers, we wouldn't ever be able to detect that the EM algorithm is important in, some, in, a, in an area like computer vision. Yeah? Because you could see similarities in text between vision papers and, and uh, EM, EM paper, and then recommend it based on that. You said you read the EM paper. I did. Have you ever read a computer vision paper that cites the EM paper? Yes. Well, There's no similarity. <laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> about bounds, they talk about, they do mention EM. There they mention EM, like it's true. Sort of show up at the outskirts. But again, imagine, look at these authors, Dempster, Laird, and Rubin, right? Those guys are writing in 1977 from their world of statistics, and as you know, right, modern implementations of EM, we learned it from Bishop or wherever, and uh, yeah, so I, I, don't, I don't think you would get it. That thing, for example, was more linked to speech, and then speech uh, and HMMs, so, and the four backward algorithms and so on, that, that would be sort of the link. And then the HMMs were using vision, so they would kind of show up a little bit. I agree that this is a faster way, but I'm not, <laughs> okay. so, sure, I'm not so sure the text alone wouldn't uh, match it somehow transitively. Fair enough. It's an argument to have while drinking, but um, <laughs> I, I can see what you're saying, that maybe it shows up. Yeah. This is a dry statistics paper, but anyway. So here is the model that solves this problem. And that captures these intuitions. Okay, so you saw the graphical model before, and now I'm showing you an example. Here's LDA as a piece of this model. Um, so how do we describe this? Okay, so I have my topics. I have my document described in terms of the topics. Okay, I have the EM paper, and now it's just about statistics. Now, the D plater documents, I have this new plate here, U. These are users. Um, XU is the preference vector for user u. All right, this is a k vector. A k is over topics, and these are the topics that you're interested in. Okay, so here's somebody interested in computer vision. <coughs> VUD is, uh, overlaps the u plate and the d plate. This is that binary random variable. Did user u, does user u have document d in her library? And this is zero or one. And the idea here is that VUD um, comes from a distribution that depends both on the topics that that document is about and on this variable zeta, which we call the correction. Okay, zeta is another k vector, and it represents who else is interested in this article. Uh, it, it represents who else is interested in this article. Factor out what that article is about, who else is interested in it. Okay, so when I see lots of information about people in computer vision reading the EM paper, Theta has to describe the words. It's never going to spike at computer vision because none of the words have to do with computer vision, barring this fun debate. Um, zeta D then is going to say, OK, I need to explain all these computer vision re researchers reading the EM paper. They're, they're clearly not interested in statistics because they haven't read any of those other statistics papers. So I'm going to put a spike in computer vision. That's the way it works. Um, again, it's sort of like earlier, it's reasoning about the posterior. All right, so I want to go into a little bit more detail about this. but. If you understood the last two slides, you understood the big idea for why this model works. Basically, what we do is we blend factorization-based and content-based recommendation. So if you're familiar with matrix factorization, um, this, is non, this is like a Bayesian version of non-negative matrix factorization. We use gammas and poissons everywhere. That's a really good idea that I can talk about some other time. Um, but basically, I have my document representation, theta dk, which represents what the document's about. 
I have my correction representation, and I have the preference vector for each user, x, u, k. And then whether or not user u likes document d has to do with the dot product between the user's preferences and the summation of what the document is about and this correction. Okay, so when you see a new document, we don't have any idea what this correction is, and so it's going to be zero, and we're only going to use the um, text. But as we see information, we're going, to, we're going to populate this correction vector, and it plays a role in forming recommendations. Okay, yeah. So here, I, I feel that the, the correction there, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, actually also um, uh, try to correct the fact that the recommendation could flow back into the topic proportional. And so the topic proportional could not be uh, able, because there are two, di two dimensions. Yes, that's right. Yep, that's right. So, so you could take the correction vector away, but then there's a tension. Right? Because then, so it's important that that's a free variable. If, when you take the correction vector away, there's this tension that when I see computer vision researchers clicking on the EM paper, I'm going to want to make the EM's representation have to do with computer vision, but, but then here's the text of the EM paper shouting at me that I can't do that because then it screws up my estimates of what the, what, what's in the document. Exactly. You got it. Okay. So let's look at some, some data with this model. We have two data sets. One is from Mendeley. This is a way that people like us can share our BibTeX files. And we have 80,000 users. They have clicked on two, they, they have 261,000 documents in their, um, in their libraries. We have a 10,000 term vocabulary, 25 million observed words, and this is sparse, right? There's only 5.1 million entries in this big matrix. I didn't mention it, but when you make gammas and poissons everywhere, it makes inference very scalable. So, it, we can handle these kinds of large data sets using, without even using fancy inference techniques. Um, we have another data set, which is quite exciting. It's a decade of clicks on archive.org. Okay, here's Paul Ginsparg many years ago inventing the archive somewhere. It was in like Santa Fe or something. Um, and we have a decade of people clicking on the archive where there's 825,000 documents, 120,000 people. Again, our vocabulary is about 14,000. And this is a little less sparse, 43.6 million entries. Less sparse because these are clicks. Just to pause and appreciate this data, the archive, physics runs on the archive. So since the archive was invented, physicists every week look at the archive, click on archive papers, read archive papers. Physics journals, from my understanding, have become basically a necessity for tenure committees. But physicists learn about each other's work and do work based on, and publish work all on the archive. So these 10 years, part of it anyway, represents physics happening over, over a decade. Okay, so let's look at the EM paper. This is in the Mendeley data set. The EM paper wasn't on the archive. Um, here's the abstract of the EM paper. You can see that it's about statistics. Here is the topic representation of the EM paper. So these are the topics that the words activate when you look at just the text. And you can see only a handful of topics have been activated. And these, the main ones are things like algorithms and probability models. So now, I took this Mendeley data. I fit, the e, I fit it. The EM paper, of course, has been around a long time. Lots of people have it in their libraries. And let's add the correction vector to this topic vector to see what we're going to use when we form predictions. And what you can see is that there is a huge difference where um, first of all, in terms of algorithms, the EM paper is one of the most important algorithms paper in this data set. But what's interesting, I think, is what comes out of the weeds. So here's something about network analysis, where the EM paper is important for doing community detection, which we talked about earlier. And here is the computer vision. Okay, so the EM paper has nothing to do with computer vision, but when you, when you look at the correction vector, you can identify that computer vision researchers are reading the EM paper. Okay, here's another example. Um, so it's basically these gamma parameters. You can think of them as expected counts loosely. Yeah. Here's another example. Have any of you read? Uh, yeah. So this is actually the correction the correction red, red, uh, the red, red one is, yeah. And red plus black is what we use when we 
form this prediction, yeah. right? This is red. This is black plus red. Yeah. And that, is there some overlap between the correction parameter and the, the top parameter? Yeah, there is. Look, so here's algorithms, and here it's increased. I'm gonna, you know what? I'll sh I'll answer that in a second. Oh, okay. uh, the, yeah. The yeah. So there's it goes black to here. Maybe I just put a line, and then yeah. Okay. Here's another here's another example. This is a book about convex optimization. You might have guessed that. And um, here again is its topic proportions. You're, you're going to see how important this book is in the data set by just looking at the y-axis. Um, and it's not about much, but it's about algorithms and a little bit it's about um, signal processing. Again, you look at who's reading it. You can see that in algorithms this is very important. Part of the reason is that this book is free online. Um, so everyone has it in their library. Um, but again, also interesting is what comes out of the weeds. So here, there's nothing to do with um, finance, but cost, trade, economic, market, financial return pops up because they care about convex optimization, but also because the examples in that book often are about portfolio optimization. And it's so clear that probably everybody interested in this reads that, although the description of the book doesn't mention it. Um, and then sensor networks and uh, distributed computing pops up, where, of course, convex optimization is also very important. OK, so this, the, my point in showing these pictures is to give you intuition about the model, but also to show that it's capturing aspects of documents, not just people, of documents that are hard to otherwise get at. OK. Um, If you're interested at the end, those of you that are interested in the details of it working better, we can talk about these plots. Since I want to end after an hour, I want to get to the next, the next pictures. Yeah? Um, in terms of the relative size of the red and the black, yeah. um, is that how much it will factor into the recommendation? Of that? Yes, that's right. So the, the red is the red, red plus black is, is the factor to the recommendation at the end. So th these are all these questions relate to what I want to show you. So these plots, imagine being convinced that this works better than everything else. Okay. Like I mentioned, the readers also tell us about the articles. We just saw two examples of that. And I want to show you how you can use the basically the the a fitted recommendation system to tell you something about the, like I mentioned, the landscape of, of the scientific literature. Okay? So you know, here is Darwin's library, here's Einstein reading, here's somebody reading the archive. You know, with all of this information, can we say something about this paper and this book and all of those books? Okay, so here's how it works. One topic that we find is about network analysis. Okay, so here are the words, network, connected, modules, nodes, links, topology, connectivity. This is about analyzed statistical analysis of networks. We can do what we do with topic modeling and just ask, what are the articles in the collection that are about networks? OK, so that's just asking for a black bar on networks. Here's everything else. Here's networks. Let's filter our corpus by those articles that are just about networks. And you get this list. Here's assortative mixing in networks, mixing patterns in networks, catastrophic cascade of failures and in interdependent networks. These are the articles that have the highest topic proportion for networks. But now we can ask. What is about networks and read by users interested in networks? OK, so what that says is I'm going to filter on, those, on that black bar. I only want articles that are about statistical network analysis. But now I'm going to add the red bar at networks to the black bar and ask what are the papers now among that subset that are most interesting. So these are take all the papers about networks, take all the people that are interested in networks, which of those papers are they most interested in? Make sense? Emergence of scaling in random networks, statistical mechanics of complex networks, complex network structure and dynamics. These are these very high profile science articles about network analysis. I think they're by Barabas. He maybe wrote this one. Um, and of course, you know, whether or not these are, their text is more about networks than other network papers, who cares? The point is, everybody has these in their library in terms of everybody who is interested in networks has these in, in their library. Maybe it's because they all have to cite them, but still. OK. Also interesting is to say, all right, let's ask this question. I'm still going to filter on articles about networks. I only care about articles about networks. But now I'm going to ask, I don't want to know who's, who the, who, which network enthusiasts are reading these articles. I want to know which enthusiasts of other stuff are reading these articles. In other words, which articles about networks have had some kind of interdisciplinary effect on, or effects is a terrible word to use these days, have had interdisciplinary 
patterns of use in other areas. And so here you see articles like mapping the structural core of human cerebral cortex. So this was this is an article about networks applied to neuroscience, and of course it's interesting to people in neuroscience. Network thinking in ecology and evolution, same kind of thing, an interdisciplinary article about networks, interesting to people interested in ecology, and then a kind of pop science book about networks linked the new science of networks, also by that guy Barabasi. This is a popular book, and so many people have it in their libraries, even people that aren't interested in networks. Finally, we can ask the question, let's take articles that aren't about networks, but ask who's reading them among the networks enthusiasts. And here you see that network enthusiasts are reading about power law distributions, statistical physics of social dynamics, and heavy tail distribution in human dynamics, right? These are articles that aren't necessarily about statistical network analysis, but these are what people are reading. This is where the EM paper could arise, for example, for a computer vision community. Okay, and we can do this with all the different topics. So here's the statistical modeling topic, where among people interested in probability models, they're reading these papers. People that are not interested in probability models are reading these papers about probability models. And you can see, here's the EM paper. Here are, here's the famous tutorial about HMMs, which made HMMs accessible to anybody, not just uh, statisticians. Um, and here's another, hey, this might be from Microsoft Research. I don't know if it is. But influence diagrams is a word I associate with Microsoft Research. Anyway, here's another kind of introductory paper that is read by people in other fields. And again, here is now, people interested in statistical modeling, what are they reading about when they're not reading about statistical modeling? Well, they're reading about the bootstrap, because who wouldn't? And they're reading about multivariate statistics and some kind of R plugin. Okay, and we can do this with algorithms. With, um, here's, here on the click data, we did this with information theory. And we can do this with every topic and get a sense of how, the, how these articles are organized by reader and by topic. Okay, so. In summary, collaborative topic models connect text to usage. They blend content-based and user-based recommendations and give us a new window to what people, how people consume articles and, and, and what, what those articles mean in terms of how people are using them. Um, okay, so I will skip the last part where I talk about probabilistic modeling and just summarize to say we talked about these two things and I can take more questions now. Thank you. Talk about. Have you uh, done some experiments to show how uh, different this information you get from reading patterns than from the citation patterns? No. So citation patterns are hard to get um, on these on these large scale data sets, and so I'm working on getting them. Although we have another goal for citation patterns, which is you know I had these pictures of Darwin's library and Einstein reading. You can't get Darwin's BibTeX file, you know, because he wasn't good at BibTeX, but. Um, what we can do is get every article that Darwin ever cited and every article that Einstein ever cited. And that is like a subset of their libraries. And so what we want to do is build a collection like that, which we're, we're working with some people at University of Chicago on getting one, and then model, do this kind of recommendation system modeling through history. Um, but, this, but, but another purpose. Yeah. Is, it, is it the parsing of the files? That's yeah, that's right. right. That's, you know, it's a whole research field, so there co-reference. Is, and so I was, I was hoping there is a database of it, but there isn't. No, I mean, not, not with the, you know, there are small databases, like the ACL has one. Um, there are other small ones lying around. But, you know, for all, ar for the million archive articles, no. It would probably be really fascinating to see, because you could then see the very influential papers in one community that nobody actually cites. Uh, That's right. That, so right. it would be pretty interesting. People that people are clicking on but never citing. I mean, right, I think it would probably, <laughs> it would debunk that kind of, academic conspiracy theorists that, we, that uh, many of us suffer from. <laughs> well, it's, it's the, the, the way the academic community is organized, you actually don't have time to write citations. So people don't do that deliberately. They just don't have space. But with your technique, you're actually true. tracking the true, true influence. Yeah, yeah. So there, we have some other work. I worked on this with Sean Garish that uses words to find influence, where we take um, like uh, the, the idea being that if it's 2014, um, sorry, if it's 1900 and you write a paper and I write a paper and Einstein writes a paper, then in 2014 we should figure out that Einstein's paper had influence and our papers didn't. 
um, just by looking at how word uh, at word use, right? The words that people are using in 2014 reflect more what Einstein was writing in 1900 than what you and I were writing then. And um, there we did use citation to validate that model to say, look, this captures correlation to citation. Talking That's right, this is more like, like micro no idea level. actually infects the community, but because whoever wrote the paper actually didn't go into, didn't follow through, they're forgotten. But the idea is there. Still. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah. Yep. So, can you say something about this hierarchical LDA model that I, uh, you, know, you never touch on that? How, uh, yeah. how important it is? So yeah, those, there's, um, so uh, some of Mike Jordan's work is on that too, on um, uh, hier hierarchical topics, where the top topic is something like stop words. Underneath that, there are big fields like, say, let's say we're doing computer science articles. There could be like systems, theory, um, AI. And then underneath that are subtopics. Um, so Mike and I worked on that a, a while ago. And uh, it, it was OK. But recently, a fellow named John Paisley really improved on it. Um, and made it scalable and also made the model richer in an important way so that there could be multiple paths through the same tree for single documents. And this captures good topical structure, these hierarchical topic models. So is that the relationship you showed earlier when you showed the relationship among topics? No, that was a correlated topic model. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. So the algorithm we change would be along the same lines of the reference you gave earlier? Stochastic. Uh, yeah, well, I would look up John Paisley's paper. So, yeah, he used stochastic variational inference. We applied it to very big data sets. Yeah. Yeah. Create a website that would allow me to put in what I'm interested in and, and give me back recommendations of what I should be reading. No, we're working on that for the archive. That's something that it's going to be called my archive. And uh, that's something that we're working on um, for exactly that. Yeah. So one of, uh, oh, there's a paid question behind you. Hold on. Oh, I was just, Patience. So, the examples we looked at, it, it seems like the user preference component dominates the topic component? Is that just an artifact of the example we were looking at? Or is there something in the way it's defined that causes that to dominate the? Um, yeah, so that, that has to do with the y-axis that I didn't explain, which is that that y-axis, it represents word counts on the tech side, and it represents clicks or oh, okay. on, the, on the user side. And so the deal is that it needs theta plus zeta to represent the clicks. And so um, there's so many more clicks than there are words in the abstract that, that it, it, it looks inflated. But no, it's not that users are much more important than words or anything like that. Yeah. Um, uh, so one, one thing I normally see here is that if you actually you know, change the order of the word in the document, you know, all this model outcome won't change. Right? That's right. So is that, I saw some paper like dynamic models that deals with the word order. So how important it is in, the, in practice? You know, we need to do all this kind of inference. Right. Well, so there's this trade-off, basically, between model complexity and um, computational simplicity. So with, with, when you ignore word order, we can compute with a lot of data well um, and fast. And also, we don't, it's in reverse, we don't need as much data to get good inferences out. Um, but if it's important to have that kind of fine-grained inference, there are models out there, like there's something called Beyond Bag of Words by Hannah Wallach, where she modeled a time series. I, from the practical standpoint, I think it's good enough to find significant n-grams in your data, like you know New Jersey, and then just model that as a single word, and then model a bag of these significant n-grams. That works very well in terms of also giving us nice topics to visualize and getting what you need or what you would get out of a real dynamic model. That's not to say that there aren't application areas where you would need a real dynamic model. Dynamic models at the level of documents, I think, are important when you have documents spanning hundreds of years, or maybe news which changes quickly. Yeah, you had a question. How about, how about the, the, the word sequence within the same document? Yeah, yeah that's what the bag of, that's what beyond bag of words. Models that's, you know, in the applications I've looked at, that's been less important, but that's not to say that they're not out there. How, how complex it is to actually, in terms of inference, uh, kind of techniques? Complex. So basically, you end up paying n, where n is the number of words in the document, you usually end up paying something like n squared or 2n. Um, but, but it's really more that the model has to be the model doesn't have as much or has so much can capture so much that it's easier to overfit in those settings, right? It's the, it's the old problem with language modeling, where you know if you go to a high n n gram, you have to smooth a lot more.
just wondering if you could talk a little more. You said that the choice of the the gamma distributions was a really good decision. Oh yeah. Um, so could you talk a little bit about sure. that? Sure. Um, okay, so let me go back to this picture. So forget about the text for a moment. If you just have this model where you cover up theta, this is like probabilistic matrix factorization, right? Um, and the way that's usually done is where you model your observed data as a Gaussian whose mean is the dot product between the user representation and the item representation. Are you familiar with that perspective? There's all kinds of issues with that. Um, one is you typically have a giant sparse matrix and you are modeling each cell as a Gaussian. So a zero and a one are each modeled as a Gaussian, say, or a zero and a four if you have ratings data. Um, and it's very expensive, right? So, so we can conquer that with stochastic optimization, um, but that's one issue. Um, I think there is a more fundamental issue, which is that the zeros and the ones aren't really the same. A zero means that you maybe saw it and didn't like it, or maybe you just didn't have time to even consider this option. Whereas a one means you decided to spend some of your precious attention on this item. This model, omit theta, just this, this model where we have zeta x and then vud coming from zeta transpose x, that is like a Bayesian version of non-negative matrix factorization, where zeta dk comes from a gamma, so these are going to be positive, these are going to be positive, and then Poisson, of course, takes a positive value as its parameter, and, and this dot product is going to be positive. Um, and what we've found is that just with matrix factorization, it works much better than Gaussian matrix factorization, and um, it has some nice properties. One nice property is that when you unpack the likelihood of that model, it only depends on the non-zero elements of the matrix. Okay, so that's a computational advantage that it doesn't require, so if you have a very sparse matrix, you don't have to look at those zeros. They can be factored out of the likelihood really easily. That's a computational advantage. It still might not be a better model, but another, it, it, but it does better in terms of things like recall and um, precision on predicting what items a user is going to click on. Um, and one way to interpret that is that this has the following interpretation, this model. It's equivalent to the following model, where each user decides from, with a Poisson random variable how many items they're going to click on, and then conditional on that number chooses those items from a multinomial distribution whose um, probabilities are proportional to this, this value. And I wouldn't do inference that way. Inference is best done using this. But what that tells you is that is why the zeros count less. That the zeros in this model either mean I didn't spend my attention, I already used up my Poisson attention on other stuff, or it means I looked and didn't want it. But you know, I think that that's why this model does better. And so these plots that I skipped, um, here is, uh, I guess this is precision, um, but this green line is Gaussian matrix factorization with content, and all of these other lines are based on these Poisson gamma representations. Some of them only looking at ratings, that's this blue line. Some of them looking at um, uh, ratings and text, and this one being the one that I just showed you. Um, so if you're interested, we have this paper on the archive, Gopalan et al. 2014, where we looked at like the Netflix challenge, Echo Nest, a bunch of different recommendation data sets, and compared basically Gaussian matrix factorization and this Poisson matrix factorization, and it just, you know, it, it outperforms Gaussian in all cases. Yeah? On the flip side, if you have different type of data where uh, it does matter, you, you do want to treat, um, treat them the same. Like you do want to say, for the sake of argument, that if you haven't read an EM paper, DM paper, then you're not a vision researcher. Yeah. So uh, that's not going to happen in this data set, in this type of you know, yeah. work. But for some other type of parameterizations, for example, just parameterize images by unwrapping the image into, uh, into a vector and then treat every pixel yes. as a picture with photons, then sometimes it might work, sometimes it might not, because you do want to say the pixel is supposed to be 0 0.6, a little more, a little less, yep. but not much less and not much more. Yeah, I agree. Um, I mean, of so, course, if the data so, is but, meaningful. But on the other hand, the discrete representation that modeling data counts has huge computational advantages we're talking about. 
So did you come up with some kind of solution that would keep those advantages and model the data, uh, allow this sort of uh, uh, almost Gaussian way of modeling uh, uh, I, cost? We don't have any problems the, like the ones you described. So you think about the Netflix challenge, this is people watching movies. I certainly don't get to watch all the movies I want to watch. It's not as though I marched through the Netflix catalog and decided what to watch. Um, and then every other recommendation data set, I think more has these sparsity, limited attention properties. Um, but it would be interesting. I don't know of what the right model is in that case, but it would be interesting to think about sign of this Poisson, wh where you have the kind of symmetric loss that you have with Gaussian, which is what's crucial there. Right, approximately, you just model the data and the inverse of the data, you have the two vectors, but it's not. Hmm. Quite That's an interesting system. idea. Yeah. I'm just curious. Uh, so, uh, oh. Okay, so I'm thinking like if you think of every user as a word and a word occur in a document if the user has read the document and just run plain topic model, will that do something similar? Um, it would do something similar, yes. Yeah, so th there is, we were working on this Poisson factorization. I was pretty excited because I was working on something that's not LDA. And <laughs> then it turns out if you condition on a couple things and make some decisions, you get something very close to LDA out of this. Um, Poisson factorization, but what you described is, is sort of close to a Poisson factorization type model. Um, but it doesn't involve topics and users together. So it right, would be right. different. There would be a normalization. Yeah. Words and so I didn't put it in this plot, but one of the things we compared to is just running LDA in the way you described. Running LDA where um, users are documents and items are words, not the other way around, um, which was what you just said. Um, and that does okay, but not as well as these other methods. These other methods capture things like different people have different amounts of, um, at different rates of consumption of the data. And, and that, that gets captured in those gamma variables. Yeah? I was just curious, how much time factors into collaborative topic modeling? Like, like when the users like viewed or read an article, mm -hmm. or, you know, does that factor in? Do you just either cut off and do it based on recency, or is there some way in which you could you know, factor that in? That's a good question. We're working on that problem right now. So right now, what I showed you is just big exchangeable. You know, it's as though you sat down and looked at all those papers at once. Um, but thinking about how this evolves in a time series, especially I think with the archive data, because in 10 years, your interests change. And if we can capture that with some of these long running users, I think that could be interesting. There's also interesting technical um, problems with doing that, like around, we, we, we're trying to model users as Poisson processes with this kind of waiting time in between their clicks, and then model the, the preference and consumption patterns on top of the Poisson process. It makes for a, you know, fancy model. Is there also, is it easy to update as new data becomes available, or is it sort of you have to run it on the whole data set, get something, and then just live with that? I don't know. So that's part of this Poisson process perspective on recommendation is to solve that issue. Like, I, then you start asking about conditional expectations given all of your previous history plus one more click. And so, you know, at first you could just rerun inference just because to see what you would get if you did the perfect thing, but then thinking about approximations would be useful. There was a paper by Mike Jordan um, <laughs> on streaming variational inference that could be relevant there. Yeah. Mike Jordan and Tamara Broderick and others wrote that paper. Could we have something like a dynamic clustering, like non-clustering on like these topic models, but for LDA. So if you do one topic models for your corpus, and then your and then you will be like, okay, now let's just things are changing based on the measure that I try to do. You know, I don't know some measure that we could find. Yeah. And then we're just like, well, make more towards the dynamic clustering. You know, as like yeah, we pass the threshold for our measure. So would you? I think that's an interesting question to ask of probability models in general. So there's this kind of disconnect in Bayesian statistics or any old statistics classically, you know, you've got your data and you analyze it with a model and then you report on the results and then you're done, right? Then you get paid. And, um, and the kinds of data that we have now are data like click streams and query streams and other kinds of streams. And it actually doesn't make sense to contemplate a model on a stream. It just doesn't compute, right? You, what does it mean to have to condition on a stream of data that never ends? And one way to think about that might be to think, okay, there's this sort of 
big process that's changing my data, and within that big process, I can model it exchangeably in a window, and I want to see when do I want to change. But this requires new ways of thinking about just solving problems with probability models um, on streaming data. I think that's an interesting area, but I don't know of any work on it. Yeah. This streaming variational inference is one, perhaps, way to start thinking about that, but that, too, doesn't, ask, doesn't say we need to change the whole paradigm. Is data publicly available? The archive data? Uh, ne neither of these data sets are, no. And Mendeley has like totally stopped answering my email, so <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> have you, have you I didn't do anything wrong. I, I, they, <laughs> yeah, but they got bought by Elsevier, and then suddenly it got different. Uh, okay. Yeah. The, um, the corpus changes you mentioned, have you given thought to different interpretations of how that affects preferences? So one thing with the movie problem, right, is um, you can, you know, view me as having a certain capacity for movies, but also there's only certain movies available at a certain time, right? And so my selection has something to do with what's available as well, uh, yeah. just as much as my own preferences. Yeah, so we, we have thought of it in the sense that we've identified that that's an issue that we're not capturing. It's kind of a, what do you call it, like a selection set or... Um, well, in search, it's more of a problem, right? Because nobody's going to click on something that's not displayed. That's right. So none of the search results are not going to click. Um, that's right. And when the, in the archive data, that's an issue in terms of some archive papers are in the weekly email and others aren't. And the ones that are in the weekly email are clicked on a lot more. And you don't want to, you know, you don't want to, this is a, another issue here. You don't want to bias your method to be recommending papers that are like the papers that were emailed weekly back in, before they had the recommendation system. You want to do better than that. Um, but yeah, no, so building in a selection set is something, you know, we've identified as an issue. And there's something called a zero inflated Poisson that could help with that, where you have a separate process that measures whether or not it's available from what you're going to consume. Um, but, you know, we haven't worked out the details of how to capture that. A lot of the data we have, we don't have that. Of course, the data you have, you have that information. So I've always thought about hiring an intern to work on just writing citations automatically. I mean, the automatic citation generation for a paper. And uh, could, could you do something like that realistically? Have you yeah. ever thought about it? Because it should be kind of possible. You get this large citation list and even a little bit of text, even if it's a bank of words text. Well, uh, that gives you an idea and then you can look at it and prune it and add, add things and so on. I don't think that would be useful because we all read every, every paper we cite. So <laughs> it would take too long to read those papers if they came from a. Well, but the idea is you know them. You actually know them. Uh, right? Papers from your you library. Know. They don't even have to be from your library. You probably know them anyways. You can cut right. out what you don't know. Or you can right. just get an idea. I'm just kidding. Sort of issue, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, that's a good idea. Now, you could use this kind of thing to do that. I mean, you could also, it would be, uh, it would be very interesting. Because typically, if you think about that problem, you would want to take citation data and then build a citation predictor. But if you take user behavior data and build a citation predictor, you might be getting a better citation set than the old ways that we get the citations kind of similar to the archive emails. That's cool. So there's a the paper at CBR this year on this, doing this, this, yeah, where you'd use basically past citations of both yourself, your co-authors, so you could add co-authors and it would start adding right. Like, right. citations would be completions yeah. based on the text. Yeah, that's cool, but I mo more, more meant like you write your abstract introduction. Right? Yeah, no, that's and what And then based on these the words, words. Yeah, it creates that. Yeah. And then you type in the program committee, and then you get the citations. <laughs> <laughs> Very cynical. <laughs> All right. Good. Thanks a lot. Thanks.